hangs from a girdle, okay? Um, and that girdle is a pelvic girdle. Remember, um, we're talking about anatomy having potentially um, debates around various regions. And, so this is the way I'm presenting it. And that includes, therefore, um, the innominate bone, or the hip bone, or the os coxa bone, depending on what you want to call it, being part of the lower limb. Most anatomy textbooks will consider this to be part of what's called the axial skeleton. Um, but we're going to completely, we're going to keep that in this um, talk and talk about the, um, this bone here, os coxa. The innominate bone as the first bone, the most proximal in the lower limb girdle. So this is the lower limb girdle bone. Um, and then we have the thigh, and within the thigh we have the largest long bone in the human body, which is the femur. And then we have a pair of long bones in the leg, so the region between the thigh and the foot is actually called the leg. So you're used to, in layman's terms, talking about all of this as the leg, and so I sometimes fall into that trap as well. But uh, if someone was to ask you to x-ray a leg, you don't go, huh, that's silly. They should be more specific, because then the joke's on you, isn't it? Because you don't know your anatomy well enough. That is a very specific part of the human anatomy. So you just x-ray this bit, and then they say, I meant the hip. No, you don't do that. But basically, <laughs> the, um, the leg is actually a very specific anatomical term here, the bit between the knee and the foot. And that is a pair of long bones, the largest being, and the most medial, being the tibia. And then the, the bendy one in our plastic models, which isn't bendy in real life, um, the fibula, which is the lateral of the two. And then when we get to the foot, we have a lot of bones, the tarsal bones, the metatarsal bones, and the phalanges. Okay, so we have them wired up here in our foot. I just need one bone really that we're not looking at there, which is the sesamoid bone in the knee and the patella. Okay, so um, I've talked about how in fetal life and fetal development the leg bud rotates around um, and consequently we end up with um, flexion and extension being um, unusual and also the numbers of the fingers and the numbers of the toes being different in terms of medial to lateral. Um, here we can see the um, nerve roots that actually, so these are the cervical nerves, cervical 3, cervical 4, cervical 5, 6, 7 and 8, and then thoracic nerve 1 and 2 nerve roots. And in the initial nerve um, limb bud, um, upper limb bud, you can see that the, um, the border, the sort of like the lateral border, is made up of the cervical and the um, medial border is made up of the um, thoracic. Um, and that remains true, you know, throughout development. Whereas with the limb bud, the lower limb bud, the initial um, lumbar starts with the um, lateral aspect, and the sacral starts with the medial aspect. Um, but then that gradually changes over time. So you end up with lateral. See how that changes? And there's a curve around here. In the groin, the sacral, look at the lateral aspect, sorry, the medial aspect, um, but they gradually turn to the lateral and anterior aspect because of the rotation. So the rotation is not complete at birth, um, so during the actual development phase, our toddlers, when they start to walk, they can actually start to toddle, that's what we call toddlers, and then gradually, once they get to about um, three or four, um, they start to actually have more normal gait. Bones and joints. So 
One of the things that we that are, that are specific about bones is the fact that they ossify, that they have ossification centers, um, and uh, ossification is the laying down of a mineral, calcium, um, into the matrix of the bone. Um, and it's complete in the adult human around in the 20s. There are some joints that hold out longer than others. Um, well, it's not joints, shall I say. There are some, um, it's wrong to call them joints. So there are some areas of the bone that hold out longer than others and remain calcified, and remain cartilage longer than others. There are two types of bone. There are bones that ossify direct from a membrane and bones that ossify from a cartilaginous precursor. A cartilaginous precursor means a bone that's fully formed in perfect shape. So for example, the femur, that would have started out with a <coughs> tiny cartilage precursor, and then gradually it will have ossified, calcium will have been deposited in it. So um, cartilage is actually like um, uh, a jelly baby. It's got the consistency of a jelly baby. It's flexible, um, but it has got the shape of the bone that it will become. Um, so an example of a bone that's direct from membrane would be the clavicle. So the clavicle doesn't have a part of that, just a it just forms from a membrane. So here we have an, um, an x-ray of a, um, a fetus, preterm, and you can see that it appears that the, the bone the omelet bone is not <coughs> So if we look at that incomplete bone in um, comparison, you can see that we've got some ossification here of this bit, which is called the ilium. And we've got some ossification of this bit, which is called the um, ischium, which is the bit you sit on. Yeah, and we're starting to get a little bit of ossification there with this bit here called the pubic, pubic bone. Pubic bone. So, does that mean there's nothing in the bits that are dark? Yes, correct. So, the fact is that if we were to dissect this um, fetus, then we would see a fully formed bone. The difference is that some of it's cartilage and some of it's calcified. Yep. So whenever you see a gap like this in a child's x-ray, um, it doesn't mean there's nothing there. It means that what's there is cartilage, not, not ossified. The femur has the femoral head just there and the shaft. Here we have just the shaft that's ossified. The head exists, the head will be there. It'll be round and it will be fitting into a cartilage cup, just like this will fit into. I mean, I'm at a bit of a disadvantage because this is a this is a right ilium, and this is a left ilium. I've got it out of the box, but there, someone's been messing with people who have put a right ilium and a left ilium, so it shouldn't fit together like that. But you see what I mean. Is that what you're trying? There is, a, there is a problem with something called congenital dysplasia of the hip, yeah? and that is generally when the acetabulum of this cup is not deep enough. So either the acetabulum is misformed in shape or the head of the um, femur is misformed in shape and so consequently they don't stay in and they can actually dislocate. That's called CDH. So x-raying for CDH at a very young age, this is, this is preterm, so you wouldn't be x-raying anyway, but um, we'll, we'll move on for a bit more development. So a bit older, then we start to see a bit more of the pubis ossifying, a bit more of the ischium ossifying, a bit more of the ilium ossifying. Okay, so you might remember that I said that in anatomy quizzes, um, or in pub quizzes, I tend to, you know, groan, because if I'm the team, member, then everyone looks at me and goes, how many bones in the human body, Phil? That's an answer that you should be able to answer. Well, of course, some people will call that a bone, and that a bone, and that a bone, three separate bones. So you might well have read that this is three bones. There's the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. 
But of course it isn't three bones, is it? it's one bone. Yeah, I would strongly subscribe to the view that this is one bone, the one bone, which has three centres of ossification. <laughs> so is it three or is it one? I don't know. And it depends why well, I know it's one, but if, um, if I'm asked in a pub quiz, I'll end up getting it wrong. As will you probably now. <laughs> okay. So once we get to 16, so that's not that long ago for some of you, your bones will look a bit like this. <coughs> And here we have the head of the femur um, starting to ossify and the acetabular cup starting to flesh out in terms of ossification. But there's no gap, they're actually in intimate contact, cartilage to cartilage. And there's also no gap between the head and the shaft and the neck. That's just a bit that hasn't yet ossified. <coughs> this is that um, dislocation. So you can see here that the head of the femur is not in the right location. Okay, our bones um, come shrink wrapped. Okay, um, so I don't know if you like watching unboxing videos on YouTube, sort of like um, slow television clips. You can watch people watch people knitting, and, they, um, uh, and there's that whole genre of people listening to people breathing. Yeah. Um, is it ASMR? Yeah. yeah. Well, I quite like <laughs> unboxing videos, and there was a great unboxing video that I watched a few years ago where a guy had got a brand new iMac, um, and the iMac was a thing of beauty back in the day when it wasn't so popular and common to have Apple products. They were very high end, weren't they? And everyone lusted after these things. And there were quite a lot of fans, and so people would watch videos of people unboxing Apple products. And so I was one of those sad people watching someone <laughs> unboxing an Apple iMac. And this guy, um, the, I, the iMac comes with a, a bit of plastic on the screen, yeah, shrink wrapped onto the screen. This guy was so excited about getting this thing, he grabbed hold of one corner and ripped it, and the glass smashed. Yeah, he cracked the glass of the screen and broke it. That's how intimately attached the shrink wrap was to the glass, so that it would actually <coughs> the bone. And our bones are shrink wrapped, and the shrink wrap we call it periosteum. And the periosteum is so intimately attached to the bone that if you give the periosteum a tug, you can actually break the bone, just in the same way that our unboxing video um, unfortunate had to send his eye map back. Um, now, what is attached to periosteum? Well, ligaments and tendons are attached to periosteum to make our bones move. The other thing about the shrink wrap is if something happens to the bone, then the shrink wrap will be pushed away from the edge of the bone. And that's called a periosteal reaction. If the bone bleeds, then blood can't go anywhere because of the shrink wrap, so it pushes the shrink wrap out creates a, um, a reaction to the periosteum, which you can often see. So even if you can't see a fracture, you can see that there is a fracture because the periosteum has been removed from the edge of the bone by something. At the ends of our long bones, we have cartilage, hyaline cartilage. And you can see here, there's a bit of hyaline cartilage. This is a knee. Um, so the surgeons have cut through the skin They've cut through this fat, which is called Hoffer's fat pad, which is the fat um, of the knee. And they've actually exposed the pearly white hyaline cartilage, which sits on the end of the femur. So that's this bit here. Yeah, and the condyles of the femur, you've got hyaline cartilage. And then they've taken a chunk out of it, and you can see underneath, you've got what's called spongy bone. Um, and so there's an awful lot of blood. All this red here has come out of there. And that photo has been taken very quickly. Well, they've quickly rinsed that off with water, sterile water, and sucked the blood out, and then quickly taken a photo because it would just ooze out of there. Um, these bones are very vascular. They're full of blood in the human. In you, in you at the moment, you've got a huge amount of blood in your bones. So the majority of, um, well, the most commonly um, 
common, it's not the most common bone type, but it's the one that most people know. It's the long bone, and it's the standard bone, if you like. Um, and the long bone, examples of which are the femur, the humerus, the clavicle, the tibia, the fibula, the radius and the metacarpals, these little bones here that go from your wrist to your finger, and metatarsals, which are the little bones that are similar in the feet, and the actual phalanges of your fingers and toes, they're all called long bones, even if they're not, some of them aren't very long. <coughs> they have ends, and the ends are called epiphyses, yeah, or an epiphysis, um, and then um, the end of the shaft is called a metaphysis, which happens after the epiphyseal line. <coughs> the epiphyseal line is the last bit to ossify, okay? Also known as the growth plate. So your epiphyse is beyond the growth plate, and then your epiphyseal line is the growth plate, or once the growth plate has ossified, you often see a white line, which is where it was, and that's the epiphyseal line. Then you have the metaphyses, which are the ends of the shaft, at either, either end. And then the middle of the shaft is called the diaphysis. The diaphysis, the middle of the shaft. They're just one type of bone though. We've got other types. So the flat bones include the skull vault, the scapula, and the ribs. So these are all called flat bones. The irregular bones, so the vertebra, and the facial bones are irregular. The short bones, these are the wrist bones and the ankle bones, the carpals and tarsals. So they're like little squares, um, almost like a dice, the trapezium, which is near the thumb, the base of the thumb there, the trapezium bone, that's known, known like it, it's called a dice, that's effectively um, the trapezium, is. it's like a square dice. Um, and then we've got the sesamoid bones, the patella being the, the only real name of sesamoid bone. I mean, you can go in again. On the pub quiz question, someone might task, ask me, you know, name of the sesamoid bone <coughs> for me, and everyone goes for patella, but there is another one called the fabella, which is in a majority of, um, a majority of human individuals um, out. Different populations have different percentages, but the fabella is a bone, a sesamoid bone you can find in the, in the gastrocnemius muscle at the back of the knee. Bone is a connective tissue. We've already talked about the shrink wrap, the periosteum. Um, these aren't really that important for, for this year's exam. I'm just putting them in there for completeness. Um, you may well get a question on periosteum, compact and spongy medulla, but probably none of the, the stuff in green in the, you know, in the exam. So then we have the compact and spongy bone, which was looked like looked like a bit of a matrix. Um, you can see the uh, as it goes green here, there's more and more space for um, the generative tissue, which generates our um, our blood and marrow. Um, and these, um, if you look at bone through a microscope, you end up with these um, Haversian and Volkmann's canals. Haversian canals are the long ones, and Volkmann's are the ones that go across. Um, and these are all lamella and lacunae and all of this. But we're talking <coughs> gross anatomy. This module is about gross anatomy, so we never look out of a microscope. So I'm not going to ask you any questions that require you to look out of a microscope. Things that go through the periosteum are blood vessels to form the bone, and sometimes you can actually see a little, what they call a nutrient foramina. So some bones have little holes in the shafts that you can see, and that's where the blood vessels go through the periosteum <coughs> into the, the bone. Um, and the periosteum provides attachment points, as we've talked about, for ligaments and tendons. Um, and the, the, the periosteum is penetrated by these fibres called Sharpe's fibres in particular areas where you need to where the, where the ligaments need to grab hold of the bone very very tightly 
or frontal tendons need to go very, 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 very tightly. So you have these sharp ace fibers as well. As I said, you'd need to look at a microscope to see this, so I'm just putting it in for perfect, you know, just to say that you've uh, you've seen it and maybe to remind you if you've already learned this stuff. Um, what you've learned. <coughs> Okay, so <clears throat> radiographic anatomy tends to give you a false impression of what the body's like because you think of these bones sitting in isolation <coughs> and then of course we give you a bone in isolation for you to look at and you name all the bits um, and then of course they see all these skeletons hanging in the corner of our anatomy rooms but the reality <coughs> is that uh, the bone's never in isolation Here's all the ligaments attached, and um, so you can actually see that the bone is never in isolation. There's none of this free air that looks like air. It's all thick, dense tissue. And even this has been completely pared back several hours of work volume to actually expose this level of anatomy here on a, on a cadaver. So always beware. When you x-ray a patient and it looks like there's nothing wrong with the bones, there still could be something significantly wrong with them. Yeah? All of these ligaments could be torn or, or um, bruised, or there could be some sort of infection that you can't see. There might even be um, some sort of a tumor. So you can only ever say, well, there's no bony injury. Yeah? So always be kind and considerate to your patients and don't think, Look at them, there's nothing wrong with them, the malingerer. <laughs> Although you will find that it can be difficult not to feel that way sometimes. Okay. <clears throat> Once we've cut through the capsule of the joint here, we can actually separate out the um, acetabulum from the head of femur. And you can see there's a little ligament there that's attached to the little dimple on the actual femur. That's called the fovea of the head of the femur. Um, and the ligament that attaches there is called the ligament of the head of the femur. That's easy to remember, isn't it? <coughs> that is its actual name. And, um, and there's a blood vessel that travels down that ligament to feed the head of the femur. So once you've dislocated this, then that will have broken the blood supply to the head of the femur. So consequently, you can't just put it back. So that's why when you have somebody, an elderly patient who's fallen and dislocated their hip, you can't just replace it and send them on their way. You have to actually chop the end of this bone off and put a metal replacement in and then remake the joint because the head of the femur will die <coughs> if the blood supply is disrupted because there's no blood supply coming from the shaft up. It only comes from the... Um, well, there may be a bit of blood supply from the shaft up, but it's not sufficient in all cases. So that's why we do these hip replacements for patients who have broken or fallen or dislocated their hips. So I've been using these terms ligament and tendon. Um, ligament means a bone-to-bone -bone connection, okay? so that's what a ligament is. Um, whereas a tendon is a muscle to bone connection, a muscle to bone connection, or a muscle to skin, it doesn't have to be bone. They're fibrous attachments, and what that means is that they're not living cells. Bone is a living structure that can remodel itself, it's made of cells, and those cells can divide and they can, um, they can be regenerated by um, mechanisms. The problem with its tendons and ligaments is that they are not living structures, they are fibres that are laid down by cells. And so consequently it can be more serious in some ways tearing a, a ligament than it can breaking a bone. Because bones will remodel um, given the opportunity and they will reunite. Yep. Whereas a, a, a ligament or a tendon um, can have can be more, more difficult to re reform and remodel. The technical term for tearing or um, ripping ligament fibres is to sprain. Okay. 
So a sprain is effectively a ligament injury. Here we have muscles. So these are muscles in the core. So these are in your abdomen. Muscles of the core. So if you do Pilates or yoga, <laughs> these are the muscles that you would probably be strengthening or conditioning. Um, and these muscles run out into the lower limb and they attach to the femur to allow movements of the femur. So when you move your hip up, so when you flex your hip, then you'll be using muscles in your abdomen, abdominal um, cavity to do that. Psoas major and minor, um, and iliopsoas, these are the muscles that are actually attached to allow adduction and flexion. And they are sometimes attached by tendons, and sometimes attached by direct, almost directly. So here we have iliacus, and iliacus attaches to, iliacus is a muscle that sits here, it attaches to the iliac crest, with the ilium. Notice the pattern, iliacus, iliac crest, ilium. So it's all named because of where it is. So the muscle pretty much direct, almost directly attaches. Very, very small amount of fibrous tissue that attaches to the periosteum. The sharp A's fibers go into the bone there at the top of the iliacus. Yep. Where you get a bit more of a sheet, so pectineus, this muscle sheet, which attaches to the pubic bone and attaches to the femur. You can see it turns from muscle to a sheet-like fibrous structure there, and that's called an aponeurosis. An aponeurosis is where you have a longer fibrous sheet, but it's not a rope-like structure, it's more of a sheet of material. That's called an aponeurosis. And the rope-like structures that um, you can sort of almost see and feel under your fingers, attach muscles, so um, psoas minor becomes a rope-like structure and runs for quite some distance as a tendon until it attaches to the lesser tuberosity, which is the stick here of the finger. So they are three types of fibrous muscle to bone attachments. They're all um, potentially <coughs> injured, and you can injure them by tearing them by um, excess force um, and that is called a strain so technically a tendon or um, a tendon injury is a strain whereas a ligament injury is a strain the very fact that you can all smile because it's friday indicates the muscles don't just attach the bone they also attach to the skin, um, so that you can actually make facial expressions, um, etc. So we've looked at the pelvic girdle. We've got the three bones associated with the pelvic girdle. The sacrum, which is the back here, part of the spine. We won't do that today. In the and then you've got the two hip bones, the anomic bones, or the os coxa, whatever you want to call them. Three joints are present, so you've got the joint between the innominate bone and the sacrum, and that's the iliac part, or the um, ilium of the innominate bone that attaches and articulates with the sacrum, so that's called the sacroiliac joint. That's there. So you have two of those, a left and a right, and then you have the joint between the two pubic parts of the innominate bone. Yeah? And so that's called the symphysis pubis, the symphysis pubis. And the symphysis pubis is a cartilaginous joint, so that means that there's a bit of gummy cartilage that sits between those two. A little bit like um, our aforementioned um, jelly baby, so that'll just sit there and allows a little bit of a shock absorbing, a little bit of stretching. Um, when, when does it stretch most, do you think? Pregnant. Yes, during childbirth. And you can get disassociated pelvises where that is completely yeah. ripped apart. And you also get that during car accidents, disassociated pelvises. 
Yeah, they call it an open book fracture, because the two halves of the pole is open out like that. Whereas the sacroiliac joints are like the joints in your fingers and the joints in your knees and your ankles and elbows. They're synovial joints, so they have synovial fluid in them and they allow for rotating movements. So they allow for um, the abdominal bone rotates slightly on the sacrum like so. And they can get arthritis and they can suffer from other things that synovial joints do, like thickened synovial fluid or lack of fluid, and they can end up getting very <coughs> stiff. Um, <coughs> the male pelvis and the female pelvis looks different, <coughs> so it's, it's, it's on all those CSI forensic investigation programs, you know, where they unearth bodies and they discover whether or not it's a female or a male victim and um, <clears throat> there are quite a lot of sex indicators around the skeleton um, and the most one of the most common and popular ones and most accurate ones is the angle of the pubic arch in a male that is very much more <coughs> than in a female this diagram doesn't really do it justice <coughs> you can get more and more female skeletons and less and less um, female skeletons. Um, one I was looking at the other day was almost flat, so that was almost 180 degrees, and that was very female. This isn't so, this isn't that female actually. So we'll look at this one. We think it's a bit difficult to tell, but I would say that's almost certainly female. It's certainly got the appearance of a, a very flat cubic arch. A bit difficult to tell when it's not articulated with its with its neighbour. But um, that would be one of the good sex indicators. So let's dig down into some detail. So we're looking at our innominate bone. So this is a right innominate bone. So we're looking at the lateral aspect. So we're looking as if, so that's as if it's there on me. Okay. So the person is facing forward. This is the anterior aspect. And this is the posterior aspect, this is the superior aspect, this is the inferior aspect. Whenever you give it a bone, always hold it. Get used to the idea of holding it so that it's facing the person you're, the examiner, shall we call them, the person in the exam who's going to mark you. Always make sure it's facing them in the, from an anatomical position. So don't hold it like that or like that, or like that. Always get it so it's oriented, and then indicate that you know where all of the surfaces are, yeah? So in this case, this is one of the harder bones because it looks a bit complicated. So hold it in the anatomical so anterior, superior, inferior, lateral, and medial. Once you've got it in that position, then you can start to put the book knowledge that you have to the bone. If you hold it wrong, there's no chance that you'll be able to translate that book knowledge that you learned from diagrams <laughs> to this three-dimensional structure. Okay, so what have we got? Well, I've... the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis, the three parts which join in the acetabulum that are the three ossification centers, and then we have the minimum bony anatomy. Now in a, um, an exam, we ask that you um, know at least six bony points for each bone, but in the ilium, you need, you need 12. Because you only, if you get a hip, for example, you need 12 from that and six from that to make your full set. Yeah. Whereas if you get the knee, then you can make your full set up from six of that, six of that, three from that, and three from that. Yeah, because you've got four bones to go at. So you need to know a lot of the ilium. So you need to know all of these, I think, quite um, convincingly. So, this is the anterior superior iliac spine. Yeah, this is the anterior inferior iliac spine, which is not actually, that's that there, which isn't labeled, you're going to know that three. That's bonus content there. Um, it's not even the afternoon. Right. 
You've got the acetabulum, yeah, uh, you've got the superior pubic ramus, the inferior pubic ramus, you've got the um, pubic crest, you've got the obturator foramen, which is this circle here, you've got the ischium, the issue of tuberosity, and then on the back, you've got the posterior inferior, you've got the issue of spine, posterior inferior iliac spine, which is that bit, posterior superior iliac spine, the greater sciatic notch. As I said before, anatomy is like a fractal, so you could go even more detail, but don't. Yeah, because you can just get into the swamp. So it's, try and get confident knowledge of the basics. On the anterior aspect, so for example, there are features here that you could name, and people do. There's the tubercle of the crest, for example, which is um, just here. It's not reliably visible on all our models, so we don't mention it. You'll have those in the books that you could try and learn. But just learn the basics, and then add on from there. The femur. So we've already given you some information on the femur. So the head, and then beyond the head, you've got the neck, okay, and then you've got the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter, um, and on the posterior aspect, you've got the intertrochanteric crest, there's a sharp line <coughs> down the back of the femur. That's called the linear aspera, which is Latin means sharp line. And then you've got your supracondylar ridges, your medial and your lateral supracondylar ridges. And then there's an intercondylar notch, which is clearly visible between the two condyles of the posterior aspect. And then um, there's a little tubercle here called the adductor tubercle, just there which is where the ductor muscles, the groin, attach to allow you to bring your knees together. You've got medial and lateral epicondyles, and the epicondyles, this whole thing is a condyle, and the epicondyle is just the, the, the dot, the sort of raised summit of the condyle. Yeah, so you can just see it there and there. So if it was a hill, it would be the bit you tried to climb up onto the top of on the condyle, that's your epicondyle. It means upon condyle, epicondyle means upon condyle. And then on the anterior aspect, between the two greater and lesser tuberosities, there's a less convincing intertrochanteric line, which you can nearly, nearly never see, but imagine a line drawn between those two, we call that the intertrochanteric line. On the back, the intertrochanteric crest is much more visible. <coughs> And then the fovea capitis, which again is Latin for the eye of the head, the fovea capitis, which is that horn there. Keep going back to this in terms of our <coughs> development. So um, this rotation of the limb in development. So it starts at 40 degrees and gradually internally rotates. So internal rotation, sorry, the hip is internally rotated by 40 degrees when you're a young kid, which allows you to sit like that, which I certainly can't do. <laughs> um, and then gradually over time, it will straighten out to be only internally rotated by about 10 degrees. Having said that, this is variable in the population, and you get people who can do that even as adults. And you can see here, there's two femurs, one of which, they're both um, at the same orientation at the knee, but the change of angle of the um, neck of femur is quite marked. Yeah, so this is an abnormal twisting of the femur. So anything from up to 10 degrees is normal in adult lines, but it can be much more than that. Probably not a good idea to allow your kids to sit like that for a long period of time because you want them to actually uh, develop normal rotation. <coughs> right.
right, well, we're nearly the end. I mean, let's just come look how much longer we've got. <coughs> we've got 45 minutes left. Okay, right, okay, well, let's carry on. So, <laughs> so Tim and Fib, I haven't put pictures in here. The reason I didn't is because it's sometimes so long, there's only so much attention span of listening to me point out only points that I know and you don't. And bones, do you know what I mean? So, uh, um, so it's not that much fun for you. I quite like doing it, but it's not that much fun for you. So, um, so here's our tibia that you can draw a diagram of. Um, Refer to the page that is in the Monkhouse book to look at the diagrams. There are better books for labelling, but as I've said, some of those have a lot more detail than you need. So the Monkhouse book has the minimum detail that you need. So if you want to make the size of the diagrams larger, so they're more visible to you, you know, blow them up, use the, use the um, take a photograph of them and then um, use that as the basis and then put the um, icon on. In your own skeletons that you use, you can put little um, stickers on so that it reminds you where things are. It's always nice to see things in three dimensions. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so you've got medial malleolus, you've got the tibial plafond, which is the surface here that um, the uh, tibia sits in. You've got the tibial tuberosity. You've got your medial. This is a. This is a, um, this is a left. So this fits with this. This is a left tibia. So the longer lump at the bottom there is the medial aspect. So that's why I know this is a left tibia. So the fibula will sit down the lateral aspect down here. Um, this is the tibial tuberosity. These, this is the medial condyle, that's the lateral condyle, and these are the intercondylar eminences, or sometimes known as the tibial tubercle, <coughs> for the attachment of the um, cruciate ligaments of the knee. <coughs> Well, it's, a, it's 195 of the earlier edition, so just keep, just keep looking. Does someone want to find it? And then uh, it must be around there somewhere. It can't be too far away. Diagram of... How about 207? Two one four. Yeah. So two one four. Top tip when you're making diagrams and when you're looking at research, only do one side of the body. Yeah. Make sure all your notes are either the left or the right, but never both, because that will confuse you completely. So never have a right and then a left because it won't work. Um, so make a decision and stick to it really early on. I only learn the left, only learn the right. Of symmetrical structures, obviously. Um, also, I would do a top tip when you're doing coloured stuff. Maybe when you're looking at the anterior surface, use one colour. And when you're labelling the posterior surface, use another. That might work as well. Is a quite good way of orientating you straight away. Um, okay, the foot. So, um, <coughs> so, the foot, as we've said, is made up of um, phalanges and metatarsals. These are all long bones, miniature long bones, they're called, because they're small. And then you have the short bones, which are the tarsal bones, the short bones. Also known as the ankle bones. So the tarsal bones, again you can go into great detail in the books, naming all the different bits of the tarsal bones. Okay, so the calcaneum, which is this bone here, your heel bone, has anterior and posterior structures. You're a first year 
radiography student, you do not need to know all of the different parts of each tarsal bone. So resist the temptation to go into the fractal and learn deeper and deeper knowledge because that will then take away time that you should be using to learn other bits of anatomy which are important. So at this stage I would be very happy as long as you could name them all. And so when we go for bony points, if we say that you need, say for example, you get the ankle joint, yeah? So, fantastic what we've got here. Yeah, so this is a right foot, so it doesn't go with this. <laughs> but, uh, but when you do learn the ankle joint, then you can name each one of these for one mark. So this each one of these becomes a mark in the in the bony points question. Um, so tail, the talus, the calcaneum, um, the three cuneiforms, the navicular, and the cuboid. So, so that's the medial, the intermediate, and the lateral cuneiform. The navicular bone, um, the cuboid, the tarsus, the talus, which articulates with the tibia and the fibula, and the calcaneum. Now, <clears throat> some if you type navicular in the wrist, there's a little short bone in the wrist that's called the scaphoid, but it used to be called the navicular. So some people will still have materials on the line where the navicular is pointing you at the wrist, but this is the, uh, the true navicular in this foot. <coughs> so, I think we're, I mean, I could go on. Uh, I could answer some questions, but I think we're sort of, we're sort of done, and we deserve a break, don't we? Yeah.